Thank you to all of our guests and, and United, United for Sustainable America for, for sponsoring all the event today. Um, so I started practicing architecture 12 years ago, and, and like George said, four years ago I decided, you know, I gotta take a break, let's go back and get my master's uh, in architecture. You know, and like many people in architecture, you're like, let's just go do something cool, you know, it's, it's a master's thesis, but I'd been practicing a while and I wasn't really a young student anymore, so I had a little bit different take on it. So my goal was to focus on something a little bit more tangible. I wanted to research something worthwhile. Um, so in doing so, you know, looking through research topics, I, uh, I was talking to my wife one day about, about different topics to, to research and she mentioned vertical farming to me. At, at, up to that point, I hadn't actually heard of it before. You know, and I, so I thought, well, that's, that's kind of insane. It's a little crazy and I don't really know if it's practical. But, but I was intrigued, so um, I wanted to learn more. Uh, so therefore, my goal then was to figure out what does Chicago consume? You know, it's, it's a city of 2.8 million people. How much food does that take? It takes a lot. And so the goal was to figure out what Chicago consumes and then take that and break it down and translate that into what, it, what would it take for a vertical farm to supply the city with this amount of food needed. Um, so in detail, I went through 30 different uh, items, vegetables, fruits, chicken, fish, eggs, and wheat, and a few other things, but mostly, mostly uh, vegetables. And I wanted to really find out everything about them, where they came from, how much energy it took to grow them, and how much Chicago was consuming. And then you can take this model and extrapolate the data and figure out basically the same thing for any other city across the nation. So, <clears throat> hey, everything's working. Good. So the first thing, you know, a little brief definition on vertical farming. Many of you already know, it's, it's growing produce in a vertical multi-story building just like this. I mean, if you imagine the food you're already about to eat or started to eat being grown in a building like this. This is an old warehouse. Um, Multi-story doesn't mean it has to be a high-rise, but it can. Any multi-story building, growing, in, uh, growing produce within an urban area is really a definition of vertical farming. Um, I'm just gonna name a few bullet points on some of the benefits to vertical farming. One, year-round food supply. You don't have seasons. You don't have seasons to worry about. Um, it's all organic. There's no agrochemicals used. Uh, there's no crop failures due to, to uh, droughts and floods and other pests. Um, with vertical farming, it would help restore our current farmland if, is, if it is used less back to forests. And forests would then be able to absorb CO2. They would also be able to bring back wildlife to those, to those places that have been wiped out 100 years and used as farmland give it 20 years, it'll grow back to a forest, and a lot of uh, natural inhabitants will come back as well. And mostly, uh, eliminates petroleum-based machinery for, for farming, um, tractors and plows, and a really big kicker is the elimination of long-distance transportation of produce to cities like Chicago. It's 2,000 miles from California to Chicago. Most produce in stores if you just look at the little sticker on that apple or you know that celery or whatever, it's probably from California. Different seasons, of course, you're gonna get different items that um, you may get from Michigan or uh, Iowa or you know, some other place nearby, but mostly very long distances. Um, so a couple things I would just wanna point out. You know, there's a big movement right now with the urban agriculture, which is just fabulous, and vertical farming is really just one part of that. So I just want to point out a couple examples of what some people, entrepreneurs, have done on their own uh, with urban farming. One is called Garden Under Glass. It's, a, uh, it's in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a mall in downtown Cleveland where this woman named Vicki Poole decided to start her own business. So she, she basically got some atrium space where you might see like a little kiosk in the atrium of the mall and it has a, a huge skylight over top of this atrium. So she was... Uh, She's growing hydroponic uh, produce inside of a mall, Cleveland. 
She got her inspiration from Science Barge in New York. They've got two greenhouses here using hydroponic growing, and they're getting their energy from uh, uh, solar panels you see in the background. And then to play along the, uh, the food truck movement that's currently popping up and a lot in Chicago and is uh, the same concept and then taking that produce to everywhere, you know, different locations around the city. Maybe every couple hours this truck moves and you're taking a farmer's market somewhere else in the city. So everything is based from this point on about food demand and food demand and population go hand in hand. Um, as the population increases, more food's going to be needed, obviously. So let's start with world population. We have 6.6 .6 billion people, a little bit more actually now in the last couple of years. Um, that's only going to increase another 3 billion people in 40 years in 2050. Well, how do you feed 3 billion more people? Right now, the, the land mass that it takes to feed the world's population, the land mass needed for growing all that food is the size of Africa. And by the time you add another 3 billion people, you're Africa plus Brazil. So let's talk a little bit about world, or I'm sorry, United States population. Right now, after the census that just came out, we're already 5 billion more people than when I originally did this research in 2008. That's already projecting us up to 400,000, I'm sorry, 400 million people in uh, 2050. It's a lot more, a lot more people to feed. 90% would be in urban areas like Chicago. But this, this slide actually kind of contradicts that. You can see farming land used has gone down. So the answer is pretty simple. With more population, there's more sprawl around your metropolitan areas, taking some of that farmland away, needing it for housing. And the other big thing being uh, uh, agrochemicals used for farming to help speed up the process and get more yield. The current uh, agricultural land use is equivalent to the size of the West Coast and Mountain States combined. So Chicago's population. Chicago's actually lost about 800,000 people since uh, 1950, and that's post-war and a lot of suburbs starting. So we're down to about 2.8 million people. Now this is metropolitan only, not uh, suburbs. I'm sorry, it's the city only, not metropolitan. So, uh, and we're projected to go up a couple hundred thousand by 2050. And the same thing again, the agricultural land use has been reduced and will continue to reduce slightly because of population growth. What does that equate? That equates to 58 little Chicago's, um, 8.6 million, million acres. Chicago has 234 square miles uh, in it. So next is to really to talk a little bit about traditional farming. And what I'm gonna show you is traditional farming, some bullet points, talk about hydroponic farming, some bullet points, and then the same thing again with aquaponics. So the latter two, hydroponics and aquaponics, are two technologies that can be very low tech or they can be high tech. Um, and they can, they can both be integrated into a vertical farm. So just a couple bullet points on traditional farming. It's 4% of all US energy goes to growing our food and another 10 to 13% to processing, packaging, delivering our food. So 17% right there for the food industry. Um, my number's a little lower versus a documentary I just watched this weekend that had Michael Pollan saying it's 20%. 50 plus trillion gallons uh, of fresh water used for agriculture. Millions and millions of gallons of fuel used to transport equating to trillion pounds of greenhouse gases from the transportation and, and the farming of uh, agriculture. And again, some of the uh, things were already discussed about chemicals and, and pesticides and transportation. One of the bigger factors, that's uh, not bigger factors, a factor that's never thought about is in, 19, or I'm sorry, in 2005, there were 715 fatalities simply related to agricultural trucking across the nation. And it's something that's never even thought of. I mean, there's trucking accidents all the time, but you never think <laughs> the trucking uh, industry, you know, you don't put the two and two together, but it happens every year. So one of the things I'm gonna show you next um, is one slide out of, uh, one 
produce item, head lettuce, I'm going to show you next. And it is one of six specific items I broke down. You know, again, I researched 30 of them. I took six, six popular ones, and wanted to know if I just took these six, how many, how many warehouses like this you see today, how many buildings would it take to supply the city's um, food need for those six items? So the first one would be head lettuce. I'm just going to show you this, and then we'll go through the same with um, hydroponic and aquaponics, too. So with traditional farming, head lettuce alone, the city of Chicago uses, consumes over 55 million pounds of head lettuce. That takes up over 1,600 acres of farmland as a market value of over $88 million. And the head lettuce has been trucked over 2.2 million miles to get to Chicago, consuming over 16 million gallons of fuel. Now, I'm not going to, I don't have the number for the CO2, but you can imagine that's a lot.